again, I don't know how much background I'm going to put in here, but like. ERA, this is a good time, mm -hmm. Equal Rights Amendment did not grow out of the 1960s, 70s women's movement. It was first introduced in 1923. It was written by Alice Paul. You'll be talking with Barbara Irvine, so <laughs> you'll get more of this there, maybe. Um, it was written three years after the 1920 ratification of the 19th Amendment, Woman Suffrage Amendment. Should I look at you or the camera? As you like. <laughs> <laughs> Just realizing I started out talking to Include the people. Yes. Um, <laughs> And Alice Paul, who was one of the two major suffrage leaders um, in getting the 19th Amendment ratified, uh, said, okay, we have one right, only one right now affirmed equally for women and men in the Constitution. And if we write one more amendment and say all of the rights held by uh, citizens will be affirmed equally without regard to sex. The first wording was a little different said women and men shall have equal rights in the United States and every state, every place covered by its jurisdiction. Um, that was introduced in Congress in 1923 by, I love all the human touches too, it was introduced by a representative, Daniel Anthony from Kansas, I think it was, Nebraska maybe, or Kansas, um, who was a nephew of Susan B. Anthony, the, one of the major suffrage uh, crusaders of all time. Oh, I don't want to use Crusader anymore either. <laughs> Campaign. <laughs> but um, uh, that was not supported by a vast number of what you'd say were progressive organizations because women's organizations, for example, and unions had fought hard to get certain protective labor laws to say women couldn't work more than, I'm making it up, 45 or 50 hours a week or something. Mm -hmm. Specific to women, there was uh, labor legislation that was protective. When we look back, we see that those protections are ones that everyone has gotten in the meantime and, and better. But at that point, it, they were real advances and people were afraid those would be jeopardized if an Equal Rights Amendment were uh, in the Constitution. What I don't understand is why they wouldn't have thought, well, instead of having um, that right for women disappear, why, don't, why wouldn't the ERA just mean that you had to give men and women that, right. the limit? Right. Um, people, it's just different ways of thinking in different eras. So. In any case, it, for several decades, um, the ERA did not get much support other than Alice Paul and her National Woman's Party. In the 1930s, business and professional women's clubs uh, supported it. Um, in 1940, the Republican Party added support of it to their platform. Four years before, the Democratic Party added it to their platform in 1944. So it's just slowly talk about how progress is made uh, step by step. That's what happened with the ERA. Um, in, 19, in the 1960s, there was another shifting where finally AFL-CIO supported it, uh, et cetera. So in 19, late 1960s, there was an effort to get it passed by Congress. It had been introduced in every Congress, every session, two-year session of Congress. Mm -hmm since 1923, and in 1972 it finally was passed by Congress, both houses, uh, as required to amend the Constitution. Each House of Congress must pass the proposed amendment by a two-thirds majority, and the ERA passed in both houses by well over that. And then it is sent to the states, and three-quarters of the states must ratify it, approve of it. Um, and. The ERA went barreling out of Congress in 1972. It got 22 ratifications out of the necessary 38. 38 is three quarters of the 50 states, so that's what's required to put it in the Constitution. It got 22, but then it was picked up by the conservative, I'll say, groundswell that was showing up. It's, oh, wheels within wheels within wheels. It's part of what was caught in the revolving door after the civil rights bills of the 1960s, and especially the um, Civil Rights Act of 64, which was signed by Lyndon Johnson, uh, was such anathema to the more conservative section states, the uh, whole southeast quadrant of the country and other some other states, that Lyndon Johnson, when he, um, the day he signed it, he said to Bill Moyers, who was his press secretary at the time, that he knows he had just signed away the South to the Republican Party for 
I've seen different things for 20 years, for a generation, whatever. I'm not sure what the literal quote is, but a really long it was a really long time. And it's still, I mean, he could not have even predicted how long. Yeah. But after he did that, then the Republican Party shifted its gears and tried to pick up a whole lot of those disaffected Southern Democrats, uh, effectively doing so, and therefore making it even harder to have progressive support in the South for things like the Equal Rights Amendment. So without going into great, greater detail about that, the ERA was partly, um, its success was um, blocked in part by what was happening in the greater political arena with the swing of the country toward conservatism. And we saw that really hit with the 1980 election of Ronald Reagan. Mm -hmm. um, so from 1972, when the ERA passed Congress, even though it went rolling out and got more than half the ratifications it needed right away, <laughs> then all of the conservative uh, politicizing of it as a chit to be traded off as a uh, one more, and I'll say what comes into my head, one more big lie, the way that the ERA was portrayed and um, opposed and what people were told by its opponents it meant were all not true and demonstrably not true because, um, for instance, Phyllis Schlafly, um, who was very involved in politics before the ERA came along um, with a group called the Eagle Forum. She had uh, written a choice, not an echo, uh, for uh, you know, advancing Barry Goldwater in the campaign where Goldwater was running for president. And she saw the ERA as an excellent um, chance for her to raise her political capital, which it did. Um, she said it would mean that women would have to go out and earn 50% of the family income. All anybody who really wanted to explore that would have to do is look at Pennsylvania, where there was a state ERA. There are now 22 states that have versions of state equal rights guarantees. So that's a whole, talk about the states as laboratories for public policy. Not only is the laboratory out there, it's done a lot of the work and it's pretty cleaned up even <laughs> around a lot of these issues that we don't have to say, oh, the ERA would mean abortion on demand, it would mean gay marriage, it would mean this or that. Look on, uh, right now, I manage a website called equalrightsamendment.org and there is a FAQ, Frequently Asked Questions page on that website that addresses all of these issues and gives chapter and verse of mm -hmm. how some of these issues have been dealt with in states, um, how so many of the accusations made against the ERA are you know, false on their face. Mm -hmm. um, others have a bit more subtlety to them, but nevertheless, there is no evidence in the states for what the opponents say the ERA would do. So um, that's, again, political life anyway. That is yeah. the four-letter word, political life. Right. <laughs> Don't count. <laughs> but, um, you know, you expect people to misrepresent. But when it happens so consistently with the same kinds of misrepresentations, that happened with the vote, women's vote, etc. you do start to say there's something bigger going on here. And the bigger thing is okay. the worldview is going to be uh, undermine their worldview. Yeah. Well, I mean, people went haywire. You know, there were arguments that, you know, if women were um, given the right to vote and had to think that hard, their wombs would dry oh. up and they wouldn't be able to bear children. I mean, just mythologically yes. crazy. <laughs> <Mythological ideas. laughs> yeah, yes. that was about Mass higher education for Magical kind of yeah, decades right? before. Use of the brain. Oh. Yes. Yes. We'll, we'll, yeah, whatever. Yes. Okay, so we'll just, there are great books about this. You've all read them. Yeah. Um, Apologies, I was going to okay. take that out of the room, but I didn't, right. so it will turn off in a minute. We'll let, it, we'll let it do its thing for a sec. Yes. But there, I mean, that kind of gets us back to the really big push in the second wave mm -hmm. for for finishing up with the ratification, yes. right? Yes. Because it got stalled. The conservative machine gets going again. That swing in the culture starts. Mm -hmm. Phyllis Schlafly is out having a fabulous career, advising women not to have fabulous careers, <laughs> um, which I love. Yes. I love those women. Um, <laughs> uh, there's no shortage. Logic is not the strong suit there. Well, there's no shortage of them. They can always find one, right? They found Sarah Palin. That's right. Um, yes. There's always somebody who's willing to become famous and important, telling other women not to be famous and important. Which, by the way, happened with <laughs> suffrage, too. In fact, there was a wonderful 
1978, I think, um, article in American Heritage Magazine. I, I boiled it down to comparing the history of campaigning for the ERA and, and the 19th Amendment, so many parallels that it's almost uncanny. Mm -hmm. One of which was that in suffrage, and I don't know the name of this lawyer, but uh, the historian who wrote this article said that there were women going out to state legislatures against the 19th Amendment, led by a woman attorney. And oh. Phyllis Schlafly got her law degree after she got going on all of this uh, politi political activism. Um, so it is, again, it's tradition. <laughs> tradition, yes, yeah, tradition. Um, just, there will never be an absence of in this case, women at being active against advancements for women. Mm -hmm. There's never a case where you don't find some members of, and I'll say the oppressed class, identifying with the dominant class, working for, speaking for. It's safe and warm here, it's and safe I don't and know what's outside. So, yeah. and yet, then the politicians who are against it, I mean, um, Say women I know don't want this. Well, who do you know? <laughs> women. Yeah. If, yes. if you don't talk to people outside your friendship circle, you're not. Gonna, That's right. May I just add a you. plug too? For in 1998, we <laughs> produced a 17-minute uh, DVD. It is now a DVD video um, called the Equal Rights Amendment: Unfinished Business for the Constitution, and it's a, a great educational tool. I, when I said that, it just flashed into my mind. There's an image of a very well padded southern uh, legislator saying women in my district don't want the ERA mm. but um, the Alice Paul Institute which is in New Jersey um, can be found online um, has the copies of that if anyone is interested it's just ten dollars and it's a super super mm -hmm. educational tool um, I usually when I'm doing a program in the ERA show that for 17 minutes and then start out the conversation with uh, well what did you see there that either took you back and uh, made yeah. you say oh uh, or uh, is brand new news to you and so on yeah. so it's it's not a polemic at all it's an educational piece and it's it's very good I mean what it, it ends up you know it can't be uh, anything other than a nonprofit uh, <laughs> product because at the last scene we got Ruth Bader Ginsburg to be in it repeating what she had said in her confirmation hearings about the ERA and mm -hmm. that uh, you know it's something that is very needed so yeah. um, it's just again to bring the Alice Paul Institute into mm -hmm. it as well and it's all uh, the home page of www.equalrightsamendment.org has a link to it too. Yeah, so, fantastic. Yeah, not yeah. the whole link to about five minutes of it, but then you can order through there. Yeah, great. So, paid commercial, not unpaid commercial Unpaid commercial. <laughs> <laughs> Props to the Alice Paul Institute. Yes. Um, yeah, um, but this gets us, this gets us, you know, back around to, it's, it's 1977-ish, things go click for you. Um, what do you do next? You know, how does your, how does your life, your action, your involvement start to pick up or change, and what does it do to you? What does it do to your wow family? Yeah, good question. You know your world. Well, just from a personal point of view, I, I just thought of the image my husband had. He said or used when he was promoted. He worked for Bell Laboratories all his life, and when he had his first promotion to a supervisory level, and had to uh, supervise other people and whatever, instead of just being a little researcher in his. Uh, office. Mm. He said he felt like a mail sack in an old movie, like a mail sack on a little country siding and the train without stopping, the train rushes through with a hook and grabs him and goes Psh! and so he felt like the mail sack and it just occurred to me that, that that's part of the feeling when you, uh, it loses the click metaphor I guess, but you know when that energy surges into you, that calling I'll say, you realize there's a calling to work on equality and in this case, equality specifically for women. Um, you get to a place very quickly where you see so many possibilities for what you can do, so many inviting ones, at least somebody like me who, I mean, I was home with the two kids, which I, I love that part of my life too. I'm not saying that was not good. It was that I didn't even, it wasn't, something I had to negotiate with myself about mm -hmm. until the point when I had another something that was very important in my life. Mm -hmm. 
And at that point, my daughter would have been eight and my son four. Um, and even then, I did not have to do much massaging of my time because I was oh, still, I did not go into, I've almost never been in paid employment working on the Equal Rights Amendment. Mm -hmm. I have done some consulting work and from 1990 to 1994, um, I was, because of work I had done after I had the click, I got involved through League of Women Voters because as I said, I was a local president at the time. I ended up going on the state league board in the mid 80s, mm -hmm. um, even in the early 80s. Uh, I'm realizing what I left out about the ratification. Mm -hmm. Can I just go back to that? Yeah, please. I said, got a lot of, of the ratifications, but then it slowed down because of the conservative opposition. There had been a seven year deadline put on the ratification process, which would have expired March 22nd, 1979. As it got to, into 1978, and we still had, we got some more over the succeeding years, but had only 35 ratifications and 38 were needed to put it in the Constitution. Um, feminist Leaders Now, which was really leading the um, campaign, one arm of the campaign was Now, President Ellie, Eleanor Smeal, and uh, Alice Cohan was very, uh, you know, sort of her, I keep thinking of Alice as, Ellie's uh, first lieutenant or whatever, right hand person, <laughs> but the, many, many people were involved in this. And um, they led an initiative to extend the deadline. It had never been done before, but um, deadlines are not required by the amendment process as defined in the Constitution itself. Yeah. The first amendment that ever had a deadline was in the 20th century. It was Prohibition, the 18th Amendment. And then Congress said, was debating how long, oh, well, we could put a deadline on it. It was all because of liquor industry interest. They thought mm -hmm. if they put the seven years on, it would kill it. Right. People could, Congress people could vote for it. When well, that case, congressmen, it was one woman, <laughs> Jeanette Rankin, Congress. <laughs> but um, they could vote for it, so they look good with the uh, dries, if you will, but they could still think they weren't going to, it wasn't going to go into the Constitution because they put a deadline on it. Mm -hmm. And... To their surprise, it passed almost as quickly as any other amendment ever had, <laughs> but was ratified and then repealed by the 21st Amendment, but yeah. that's another story. Yeah. <laughs> um, so uh, other, after the 19th Amendment, which had no deadline, every succeeding one had a seven-year deadline, just Congress got into the habit of doing it. Mm. And um, no one had ever tried to extend it because they always passed well within the seven years. Ratified. And so um, now, and other groups said, we may not get three more states. They saw what was happening politically with the conservative pendulum coming mm -hmm. to knock everybody off their feet. And so they said, let's go for an extension, tried for another seven year extension, ended up after a massive march in July of 78, Congress passed a, an extension from March 79 to June 30th, 1982 not the seven years that were desired. Mm -hmm. And so um, that gave a little more breathing space, but 79, 80, Reagan was elected, 81, June 30th, 1982 came, and there were still no more ratifications than 35. Mm -hmm. So that deadline has passed. We are sitting here in 2014. Um, there are 35 ratifications. Many would say the deadline passed, they go up in smoke. A number of people would say, and it's based on good legal analysis, that there are, it's not that simple, that there could be ways either through Congress revisiting the deadline, which they already showed they thought they could do when they extended it. Um, I won't go into all the legalities, but the point is that there might well be a way to keep the 35 uh, state ratifications legally viable mm -hmm. and therefore need only three more and we're calling it the three-state strategy mm -hmm. so again people can if they're interested go on the website equalrightsamendment.org look under the strategy page and some of that is explained and there are links to some articles um, so there's been um, this second wave picking up with the ratification yeah. now um, there are 
two processes, the traditional way of starting over two-thirds of each House of Congress, three-quarters.